Anyways, I'm going to talk about this stuff this time. <laughs> so again, let me show what is my favorite slide. I always like to start my uh, material science lecture that talks with this. Uh, where I like to sort of tell people uh, where my work is in the kind of uh, pantheon of materials processes. So on the x-axis here uh, is length, on the y is time, and what you see in the different boxes are uh, materials processes, and uh, outside the boxes you see the buzzwords of the names of the techniques that are typically used to model these processes. So on the two um, extremes of this scale, uh, most bottom part is uh, first principles approaches, which look at a small number of atoms or electrons and uh, try to uh, get some properties of them at that scale. And on the highest uh, scale, uh, where uh, many of the engineers live, uh, they are continuum methods, which try to examine functional properties like mechanical deformation, etc. These two are typically very, very disconnected. Some of the properties here for years have been used to say, uh, educate some of these models in terms of stiffness and elastic coefficients. But where these models really have been lacking in the past 30 years, roughly, uh, is their ability to look at mesoscale structure. Because it turns out at least for mechanical properties, but also functional properties, that's really the secret sauce that determines the material properties, not down here. And so this has changed a lot in the last uh, 20 years, and in particular in the last 10 years, entire industries of selling packages at this level, commercial packages, which use now phase field type approaches to model microstructure evolution can be found. And the idea is that the tapestry of the mesoscale is established at the time of solidification, and then post solidification, that tapestry also couples and feeds back to additional solid state properties like defects and secondary phases, et cetera. So this mesoscale structure kind of hinges on solidification as its starting point, and then can be used to feed these upper scale models. And to be sure, these models don't live in a vacuum, uh, being somewhat uh, mesoscale, um, at least over here, they need input from the atomic scale. So I'm going to talk about what's in the green arrow today, and I'm going to focus on, on that topic. And I'm gonna start off just by first giving some introduction for those uh, uh, tuning in who don't know what solidification is or don't know it in the sense of, you know, beyond the, the textbook definition. And, and then I'm gonna sort of use, uh, the uh, talk about the techniques we use to model solidification and what we've learned from it. So here's a kind of go-to experiment uh, that people have been using forever to model uh, pattern formation and solidification. And it is in fact a paradigm for many other types of patterns, not just solidification. And so the idea is you have a microscope slide with some fluid in it, and you put it on two hot, uh, on a stage that comprises two hot plates, and then you move the, mic the, the slide containing the fluid uh, to the left, and you're essentially pushing it through a thermal gradient from where the hot liquid gets to go to the cold side, and eventually it starts to crystallize, and an interface develops, and it starts to move, and patterns start to emerge on this interface. As a matter of fact, uh, this is uh, work on X-ray tomography on copper, <coughs> showing essentially a cruder version of this experiment. This is really control, right? So you have two processes: how quickly I pull and what the thermal gradient across the sample is. And th this is more a crude version of this, where it kind of just directionally chills. You can see an interface growing and becoming uh, growing into patterns. And what you could see is there's a clear method to the madness of these patterns, where if you plot the growth velocity, how fast this front here, it's planar, here it's not. You can always sort of see the top layer as kind of the mean front. The faster the front moves through uh, a thermal gradient, the different types of pattern emerges. If it moves slowly, it becomes planar, or very fast, it becomes planar. Whereas if it, in the intermediate regime of velocities, you get this myriad of patterns, mostly cellular, but then side branching also developing. Here's what it would look like in a more controlled stage experiment like this, where an interface like this would grow, 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 wiggle, 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 become unstable, then cellular fronts would grow, then these cellular fronts would then further decay into these beautiful so-called dendritic patterns. And again, like I mentioned, uh, you know, I guess, you know, we still don't have a good solid analytical way of predicting what the spacing between these patterns are either in this direction, the growth direction, or the transverse direction. 
we have a lot of simulations and a lot of uh, pseudo scaling theories, but there's still no unique uh, way to link this length scale unambiguously to the material parameters I'll talk about in this talk. Um, right, so how do we model this? So as the name suggests of my, of my research topic, basal modeling, this is one of the simplest basal models that goes back to the 80s, Model C, if you've read the Hohenberg and Hamper in the paper. Uh, it's, it's quite simple, but still quite beautiful. It's, uh, facial models usually comprise coupled set of PDEs. They kind of look like a reaction diffusion system where there's a PDE at the top here. We're looking at a single crystal of uh, something that pushes interfaces and it's driven by or limited by the growth of some coupled slower field like thermal transport, mass transport. And these two equations uh, are typically derived uh, from some functional that is meant in some phenomenological way, although it can get more precise if you have the computer power and uh, the time uh, to represent the free energy of your system in a closed volume and box with total number of particles. And this free energy is very well recognized, I think, in the physics community as a kind of Ginsburg lined up free energy. And instead of making you a constant, we make it a field. That's why you get two equations. And one term sort of creates two states of phase or phases of the system, solid liquid. And the last term in the equation uh, in the free energy represents a kind of bias or breaking of symmetry between the two states, saying, well, the hotter state <coughs> is either more stable or less stable, depending if you're above or below the melting point. And T here represents temperature. And to be sure, there is a bunch of parameters that enter this equation a time scale, an interfacial scale that separates the zone between the two phases, salt liquid, a coupling constant which is inversely proportional to the barrier to nucleation, plus other things like latent diffusion, temperature, specific heat, and a thermal transport coefficient, alpha, which is proportional to the conductivity. Um, usually in the process, yeah. That G of phi, uh, where does it come from? You kind of make it up. Right, right. Quadrat, right? It's a, it's a five four potential. It's like a four order potential that essentially you can pick an infinite class of potentials, but the key thing here is that you want them to be minimal at two states of order that represent your liquid and your solid. So liquid is usually zero order and solid is some finite order that you can fix to some number like one, or you can actually uh, tune it to have the same ordering as say an MD simulation showing a block of crystal equilibrium. <clears throat> and then this breaks the symmetry with any kind of odd polynomial P of phi. So the simplest one is linear, but odd higher order terms make it more convenient to fix the ordered state of it and make it stay put. <clears throat> so that the, the, the work that I'm going to talk about actually is not for pure materials. What I've just shown is for pure materials. Uh, what I'd like to explore more is alloys, where some interesting things happen. And most real materials are always, always mixtures of something, even when you try to make them pure. Uh, here, the free energy kind of gets an upgrade where you get what was there before. Here, uh, tell me it's the GFI graph. Okay. And then in the red, I add additional ingredients to take into account the, the chemical part of adding, say, a solute to a solvent. So C would represent the solute concentration, in, um, you know, which is a minority species in a, in a solvent, which is the majority species. And so now you can, again, look at the landscape, not just in, from the view of the ordering phase, which is a double well, if you just look at it along this plane, but for each level of concentration, the states of order change. Right? So liquid always rise the phi equals zero minimum, whereas the non-zero state or the, the, the order state rise changes values depending on the composition as it opposes. So different solid solutions have different states of order. And you can, again, go through some you know, tedious math, but it's, it's undergraduate equilibrium thermodynamics to basically find the equilibrium states at any given concentration and thus select what material parameters and what energy parameters you should be putting in these double wells. And you can really go to town on this depending on how accurate you want to get. So here I show uh, the curve I postulated phenomenologically and the blue shows a fit to an experimental curve for a given solid phase. So experimental, this will be calorimetry experiments. 
get the free energy as a function of different compositions, of densities, or both, and then hand it to you. And you could try to fit the parameters of your model to match actually that, which is important in terms of not just defining equilibrium states, but also curvature of the free energies that uh, speak to the mobility uh, of the transformation. And then you can use, this was for a single crystal growing with a single solute species. You can really go crazy with this in terms of labels and bookkeeping and say, okay, I'm gonna model uh, a bunch of order parameters, each representing its own distinct phase, uh, a bunch of solute concentrations, these C thetas, each representing a different type of element mixed in my original solvent. Uh, you can have free energies for each phase and then come up with uh, more than two equations. You can have an equation for each ordered phase you're trying to simulate. Coupled, so that's the first one. So it's like a Ginsburg Landau theory, only the non symmetric part is more complex. Now. It's this would be the symmetry breaking part. Oops. Here, coupled to a thermodynamic driving force, which is the difference in the grand potential densities, which are now functions of the chemical potential, the local chemical potential. And these are coupled or limited by the diffusion of chemical potential of each species. That's what the index J represents. So I don't want to go over the math because this just is good if you can't sleep at night and you try to figure out how it all works, but it works. And the idea is you have order parameter equations coupled to chemical potentials or mass transport, and you can go to town. I'm going to limit myself in what I show today just to one crystal with one solute species. There's a lot of interesting physics there. And so here's an example of a Beautiful 3D crystal structure grown by the previous model. It's one order parameter representing, gray represents the topology of the interface between solid and liquid. The warm colors represent large levels of impurity concentration and the dark, colder colors represent less concentration. And this, uh, for example, can be used to understand how uh, this particular picture comes from, an ex, uh, from a modeling of an experiment done by some collaborators some time ago where they looked at powders solidified rapidly and then they sectioned the powders by tomography and looked at the 3D, 3D reconstructed the crystal structure and we tried to simulate. And again, uh, this has a very characteristic pattern of an un unstable dendritic interface. <laughs> and one thing I, draw your attention to is the different scales on this problem. Uh, the sample itself could be hundreds of microns. The branch spacing between these undulations on the surface on, on the order of 10 microns and the interface, the thing that actually separates solid from liquid could be tens to hundreds of nanometers. And unlike a second order transformation where you have a sweet spot or a critical point where all scales sort of grow, here in the first order transformation like crystallization, you always have to contain even the smallest length scale with you to, you know, because it emerges from that scale onwards the paths. They don't disappear. So that creates a, a very stiff numerical challenge to solve these problems. Here's another cool application we did on looking at uh, well joint morphology. You know, you take two metals, you drop some liquid metal on top of them, you let it crystallize, and it effectively welds the two metals. Uh, we modeled the joint and you can see that there's a very different morphology. Again, I don't want to go into the details. I'm glad to if you want to ask for that because that's not really the main theme of the talk. But again, what you see here is a preponderance of very strong dendritic structures. These sort of dendrites kind of coalesce all over the place to form the final solid pattern. So there's a kind of tendency up in most of the time when people look at solidification with facial model, they look at things in... Um, you know, you have parameters and you, you're assuming that the solidification proceeds slowly enough that the interface at least is always some kind of local equilibrium, kinetic and chemical equilibrium. And uh, to be sure you can actually match the material parameters of your facial model so that effectively, if this is the order parameter showing, you know, what it would look like in the solid, zero in the liquid, and that's, this little blip here represents the normalized uh, reduced temperature field. The zone here, W, represents this interface between solid and liquid. Uh, if you were to do a, an analysis of this model when the interface and the coupling constant become really small, what you'd find is that 
your model evolves in such a way that the interface is roughly always in local equilibrium, uh, where your interface is essentially at the equilibrium value corrected possibly by a curvature effect. And there's supposed to be some kinetic effect, but it's very negligible. And so you can then uh, tune the parameters of the model so that effectively simulating the model in the box, which is a model that essentially assumes the interface are sharp compared to any other structure in the system. And your process is being driven by diffusion and two boundary conditions. One telling you how the velocity moves locally based on thermal gradients across it. And one that tells you that the interface has to sort of always be at some kind of equilibrium corrected only by curvature effects. So this is an equilibrium sharp interface model and most phase field models kind of operate in that regime. That's why you get a preponderance of dendritic structures in most of the literature about solidification, because that's also a trigger that says, oh, that's pretty slow solidification. And, and so this model here, as you can see, is really a three-parameter model, one that depends on the thermal diffusivity in red, top, the capillary length, surface engine, and possibly some kinetic correction to velocity, which is usually zero, at slow enough rates. And you quench your initial liquid, watch it nucleate, face with models, if you add noise, then can sort of spontaneously generate homogeneous nucleation and crystallization ensues. However, things get a little more interesting at high solidification rates. And this has become quite uh, of high interest these days because of things like 3D printing, laser welding, where it's quite typical now for, you know, aircraft manufacturers to design the entire engine out of a 3D print. No more casting because it's cost effective, much stronger. And the um, problem is that the cooling rates, it's very typical now to sort of 3D print in drops that are 10 to 15 micrometers thick. So the cooling rates can achieve 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9 kelvins per second locally. And so now these assumptions that we put into our studies up to now that all oh, the interfaces in local equilibrium kind of like go out the window. And so let me just walk you through some uh, uh, basic changes that happen. And these are the only ones you really need to know to talk about what I'm going to talk about. Um, here is um, a, a schematic showing an interface. These three vertical lines at the top are the interface, hypothetically, of a planar front in a solidifying two-component mixture. Think aluminum copper. And the curves are the solute profiles sort of connecting to that interface. The one on the left is in the solid, the one on the right is in the liquid. And um, under very slow conditions of cooling, the ratio of the solid concentration to the liquid would follow what's predicted by the phase diagram. Another way to say the same thing is the two sides of the interface would be in chemical equilibrium. The chemical potentials would be matched. However, as you see on the top scale bar, as the velocity starts to increase, uh, the change of concentration on either side of the interface starts to decrease. The, the, the chemical potential is mismatched, and the concentrations start, the gap between concentrations starts to close. This is known as solute trapping. As a matter of fact, if you move fast enough in an alloy during cooling, you can almost have no time for mass transport across the interface to occur, and the alloy acts as if it's stuck in its initial composition throughout. As a matter of fact, at that point, you take it back to the point where thermal transfer becomes a living, a living process, not mass transfer. So is the chemical potential constant um, in each phase? The chemical that? potential is constant in here in equilibrium, right? but over here there's a jump, there's a step jump across the interface as the velocity gets up. But in the phase, each phase is a constant? It's roughly Probably constant yeah. if we assume that it's been going for a long time and allowed to do it. But there, to be sure, as I showed before, there is a kind of you know, chemical potential, chemical potential gradient. And if you stop the whole process, then it'll kind of all homogenize and become constant. But the key thing is the equilibrium can no longer be assumed to be an equilibrium. So the, 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 per, the parameterization of the face field models to some equilibrium type of interface kinetics has to be abandoned. And you can see that this has direct implications on the morphology shown below in the three stages. Uh, at equilibrium, you get these beautiful dendritic structures that we, we've seen about since the 80s and 70s, and people have sort of spent a lot of time looking at the physics of. But as you start to get more and more uh, fast, your interface, your chemical potential mismatch leads to more cellular structures, 
And eventually you even get these banded structures where you, you start getting such fine cellular connected structures that your interface moves almost like a planar front, but it starts to oscillate in its speed. So you get some really cool effects. And so the long and short of it is that to describe this, uh, John Kahn, who pretty much has created theories for almost all these processes at some point in the past, um, realized that you have to amend the sharp interface description of solidification around the interface to account for velocity corrections. And so the top equation, uh, if you ignore the thing in red for the moment, if you think about it very carefully, it just says that the equilibrium concentration at the interface follows the phase diagram. That's the stuff in the big red brackets. We get the beta here. And the interface temperature is itself an equilibrium. It's a melting point minus some curvature correction. However, when you start to move at any speed past zero, really, but let's say fast enough, we're talking centimeter per second, um, you need to create a velocity correction. This K of V is this ratio of interface concentration solid to liquid side. And it actually changes K of V in such a way that at large V it becomes one, and at small V it reaches its equilibrium value. And so again, you can read all about this, but the main thing is that there's a propensity for the solute to segregate differentially based on speed, and that needs to work its way into how the concentrations on either side of the interface are now mapped out during the solidification process. Um, so this actually has been quite, caused quite a fervor in, in conferences in terms of, is this the correct model? Everyone agrees that this happens, but is this the correct model? And uh, the model I just showed you before, uh, originally developed by John Kahn and people at NIST, uh, is not necessarily the only model. As a matter of fact, MD simulations have a different story to tell. Uh, the curves on the right, the data on the right is all from MD simulations done by a former student of mine and Jeff Hoyts, who was at that time at Sandia and then came to McMaster. And the solid curves represent different theories going through the data. So what MV seems to indicate, and K here, the y-axis represents, again, the ratio of solid to liquid concentration as a function of the x-axis, how fast the interface is moving. And what this curve shows is that um, at zero speed, K becomes, it's not really zero, it's the equilibrium value, but it's a very small number. The, the, the jump is, you know, it could be very large. So the ratio of solid to liquid diffusion could be of order 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.02. But as you start to speed up the interface, this partitioning starts to increase, and there's some finite speed at which it hits one. So in other words, you get complete chopping. The theory I just showed you predicts that a complete chopping will only happen at infinite speed. So MD seems to indicate otherwise. And the reason is because atoms diffuse around the liquid by taking jumps. They're chopped in these cages inertially, and then they jump out of these cages, jump, jump jump, but they spend some time bouncing around cages of atoms before they jump. If your speed is moving so fast that it starts to match the speed of their jumping inertially, then no diffusion whatsoever happens. And your solute gets just trapped as a non-equilibrium distribution in the solid. And so you get complete chopping at a finite speed as shown in MD. Notice that at low velocities, both the MD and the uh, slower models that I talked about before do match. Okay, so, so this is a, a real effect also observed in D. And yeah, so you get complete trapping at some point. But where, what I'm going to talk about today is not at this point yet. You've got to get even faster than what I'm talking about now to get here. Uh, I'm going to rely and be talking mostly about the stuff on the left of this dash curve. And so a few years back, a couple of years back, what we did is we reran this so-called asymptotic analysis of the phase field model to say, okay, well, what do you have to do to the model parameterization so that when it's doing its thing, the interface emulates not local equilibrium, but local non-equilibrium based on the models I just showed you, the model I just showed you. And what we did was we have to add something known as an anti-trapping flux. It's an extra non-variational source term to the mass transport equation that essentially slows down the diffusion enough in the interface 
so that solute doesn't have time to diffuse and it gets trapped in the solid according to some prescription of this model I showed you before. And again, it, yeah. Uh, from, from these equations, can you find a length scale for, you know, we have these uh, grains that are formed? Yes. So after you tune the model to mimic something at the interface and match the two parameters, uh, that is, you know, both in, in, in its slow solidification and stuff I've shown now, the kind of name of the game is always, can you get some length scales that emerge based on the process parameters, like the physical parameters? Uh, the one scale that always stays the same is the interface width, that's length, that's an atomic structure. But then the emergent scales really depend sensitively on how you cool and the type of alloy chemistry you take, et cetera. And there are ways we can map them, we can fit them to sort of different models and see which model is better, which way, you know, which analytical model is better. Uh, so to date, there is no single analytical model that fits the numerical data or the experimental data. And if I just naively do the dimensional analysis and come up with- You get three length scales, the length scale of the interface, the length scale of the curvature that's possible, based on surface tension and a length scale of grain size based on thermal transport. These three um, uh, length scales are always used, but their combination to create a scaling function is still not universal, okay? So people thought, oh, it must be simple. It must be that the scale of these dendrites just goes to the cooling rate to some power scaled by the capillary length times what's called the thermal length. Doesn't work. It looks nice over some part of the data, but it breaks down over large portions of the data. And so the long and short is we took a facial model and we matched it. Uh, we, we, we added some contributions to mass transport to allow trapping at the interface to occur, thus emulating the non-equilibrium partitioning of solute, which we think is important to take you out of this dendritic regime that occurs really when you're locally equilibrated. And here's an example of the models before and after. Uh, on the left-hand side here is the equilibrium partition coefficient. Again, this is the ratio of solid to liquid diffusivity at the interface as the model is running in full dynamic mode. We, we track interfaces and sort of match, track what the composition is on either side of the interface. On the x-axis is velocity. This is the left side graph. The horizontal line up to some velocity, uh, about 0.07, shows all the data from our simulations scattered around the black line. The black line, Ke, is the equilibrium partitioning coefficient. So it means that up to some point, uh, you know, your, your model is, uh, if, you, if you force your model to pretend it's a local equilibrium, it'll maintain a local equilibrium of the solute concentration ratios. With this new model I showed you on the previous page, and whose mathematics I didn't go over, uh, but believe me, it works. Uh, basically, now your simulation data starts to follow this slanted line. That slanted line comes from this non-equilibrium continuous growth model of cons, which presumably is the one that ought to be followed if you're correctly partitioning solute during a dynamic process where your interface is moving on these scales shown here. On the right-hand side, similarly, we look at the local undercooling that your interface is experienced during growth dynamically. And the horizontal line up here, the, the dotted line, is what you'd expect if the interface was mimicking a local equilibrium condition. This is a flat interface. Um, whereas the two slanted horizontal lines correspond to adding a non-equilibrium behavior in your model. And the one up here with dra no drag and drag is John Kahn in his model kind of went over it fast, had a parameter called the drag parameter that said, how much of the energy of diffusion is dissipated laterally across the interface rather than spent on transporting atoms across the interface, right? So if, if you're a solute atom bouncing around from the liquid trying to join the crystal, you have a choice to either go onto the crystal or you can even diffuse down that narrow path of the interface. That's called drag. So depending on how much drag you think is going on, and it's hard to know, this is not something that's easily determined. Uh, the drag parameter can be emulated through the space field model uh, upgrade we, we added. So now armed with this model that can presumably handle non-equilibrium kinetics at the interface, we set out to look at some 
applications of this and see if A, our model works and B, what does it actually predict and compare with experiments. So we teamed up with some people in Finland at the VTT who themselves have teamed up with some people at the um, Livermore National Labs who do dynamic transmission electron microscopy. And the long and short of this, I'll show you the reference for details. You know, you, you take uh, liquid aluminum or liquid aluminum copper, you splat it on some surface so it gets really cold really fast. And a melt pool develops that then closes in. Here's a, a picture of the melt pools in, in darker gray closing in. I indicate it with a yellow arrow here. And as you can see, the striations behind the interface are not dendritic, they're very sort of fine grained cellular moving in as the interface closes. And they can track the position of the interface and plot it as a function of time. And again, uh, this technique is really cool because it allows us sort of in situ observation of the interface, but also the morphology behind the interface. They can do a deeper analysis of the striation morphology behind the interface to look at things like the length scale of these striations, as well as the rate at which the interface closes. And so what we did is we, we, we looked at their, uh, you know, we fire a laser at this thing and they cool, the, they close the laser and then they, this thing happens. So we modeled as best as we could the um, thermal profile. So here's the drop. We modeled a portion of that drop shown in blue here. So our interface would start here and move inward along the blue to mimic kind of the whole process of their interface going in. Is there a variation in here? No, I, there's a few, it's about a hundred nanometers, maybe a little thinner. So it's not truly 2D, but it's pretty 2D compared to the micron scale drop size. So, you know, the good question, we're, we're, we're still assuming that we can <coughs> min match this to 2D results. Is there a thickness profile at the interface, at the drop interface, no, the other one, the other one? Over here? Sorry. Like black. Yeah. Yeah. It starts at the edge because it's thin. Yeah, I guess that's just some kind of atmosphere, like some noble gas atmosphere to avoid oxidation. <coughs> but I'm not sure of the details. But that's a good question. There is a thickness here, but I, I don't know the value of it. So, yeah, so what we did is we took the thermal profiles that correspond to. Uh, yeah, modeling the experiments because you can't actually measure the thermal profile. You, you measure your laser power, your time of being on and off, and they measure the, the, the some kind of temperature profile as shown. Yeah. The different colors represent time. We inserted this into our model. Then we said, okay, well, let's run our model to do some validation tests and show that the growth, focusing on the right hand curve on the bottom here, the growth of the interface versus time the white, the gray dots represent uh, what you predict from this continuous growth sharp interface model. The black dots represent the experiment and the green represents our facial simulation. So this was just a way of saying, if you take the thermal history predicted from, you know, modeling this laser's uh, pulse and shut off and subsequent cooling and fed it into the model and watch your model sort of produce these moving fronts, the front itself at certain isotherm would move at the same speed and rate roughly as what you'd see in the experiment. So the experiments kind of stand in the middle of two models, a sharp interface model and a face model. So we felt, okay, it's pretty decent as an estimator, uh, as, as, a, as a driving force to be using this thermal profile. Of course, it's not ideal, but it's pretty decent. And here's some results that come out. Uh, here's a drop showing an interface, the, 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 the main picture is the D10 at different times shown at the top left, and the little insects are from our facial simulation. And what you see is at the beginning, you have these bulbous little cellular structures that have just been created. Uh, they grow out and elongate a little bit. It's more clearly obviously shown in the facial simulation than it is in the experiment. But what's interesting is, and more important is at some point, the D10 shows kind of almost like a milky white flat interface just following out. And the simulations kind of show similar that at the top, all these cellular structures have merged to form almost what appears to be a continuous front with very fine striations in it. And here's another view of the same thing. 
um, showing uh, our simulations. On the left, the colors represent orientation of grains. On the right is concentration. What's very interesting and similar to the experiments is you see initially you have a bunch of disconnected grains that start to grow, but they very quickly join to form almost a continuous, very gradually wiggly front of interlocking grains of different disorientation. But if you look at the concentration, it tells a more interesting story. Within a given grain, you see that there are many striated channels of solute. So it seems like this, of course, is hard to see from the D10. The D10, at best, we can get orientations. Uh, what, what, what seems to happen is that adding this effect of non-equilibrium partitioning leads to a cellular structure and ultimately even almost a planar front. But within the planar front, whether in one grain or multiple grains, you get these striated solute patterns. And this is very different structurally from anything you get in the analytic pattern. Have we been able to quench samples in like one of these states? No, not that I know. These have all gone to closure. Here's another view of, uh, on the left is the phase field simulations, on the right is the theta, uh, showing the top panel show the orientation map, showing reasonable agreement. You'll see that the initial cell length in our uh, simulations are a little longer than the initial cell elongation than the DTEM. I'll talk about that in a minute. But later on, you get just a few surviving cells kind of growing almost like block polygonal structures in both cases. And if you look at the concentration map on the bottom left from our model and the EDX concentration map on the right from the experiments, again, you see somewhat similar patterns. The initial grain structures very quickly give rise to just a few isolated grains that have a lot of solute striations within them. In the experiments, the striations don't seem to be observed, but we see a lot of these islands of solute. It could be that there are striations, but they're just not resolved. We don't know. The point is these trapped striations and slash islands of trapped solute are all destined to become other phases eventually, if you cool this long enough, they're going to become intermetallics. Or they may even become voids, like literally just gaps in the material, which will then be a problem. And so more work is being done to understand. Uh, to, uh, we think that at this point, not only is non-equilibrium effect of solute partition relevant, but you also have to bring that temperature dependence dynamically, because that should be a rate limiting step in terms of, say, latent heat and its subsequent diffusion. That's why probably the experiments have shorter initial grain elongation than the theory, because in our theory, we kind of freeze in temperature at every time, but the temperature should probably be now brought back to the game as a dynamical variable. All right, so that's already showing a lot of promise that at non equilibrium rates. So, how am I doing on time? Oof. I got five more minutes? 10 minutes. Okay, yeah. all right. So, that's, uh, that's what happens at, uh, you know, so th th this was very interesting because already you see just a small break in what you do to the interface. What you assume is happening at the interface already leads to completely different structures. Now I'm going to talk about something that uh, I've seen in my Paul Giardini at the back there has been recently working on to look at very rapid solidification. It's again with the same group where now uh, we were motivated to engage in this study from one, of, uh, from one of the experiments they showed us. This is an experiment done again under D10 by the same group uh, at very rapid solidification rates on pure aluminum. Just take it, cool it, watch it solidify. And what they saw was something that's very non-typical for solidification. These colors represent roughly different grain orientations. But what you'll notice within a given grain, so look at the circles, you'll see changes of orientation within a crystal itself, which is very, very atypical. If you take any cast sample solidified, you'll see multiple grains, but within a grain, the orientation is deadlocked. It's very rare that it rotates within a grain. What you see here is, you see within a grain, the color hue changes, indicating that somehow orientation has happened while solidifying within a single grain. And these over here, these little speckles here called mislabeling, 
we're told are probably evidence of topological defects, dislocations that have emerged within the crystal during solidification. But they've been able to do concentration maps on this sort of scale too. I think so. Well, they did concentration maps too, right? Did you use the, any concentration maps? So I'm not familiar. We, we didn't actually use them, but they have, I think, because I showed EDX before on the slower quenches, so they probably can do them there, but that, we didn't use those. But I would imagine there might be uh, concentrations where the orientation is slower. There the might. But remember, this is pure aluminum. This is just AL, it's not ALCU. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think it was three. I think it was three nines pure. Just uh, yeah, if I remember yeah. one of the uh, yeah. journals. And then, and then this is a TEM uh, specimen, so it's thinned down for transmission. Yeah, yeah. Transmission. It's a, it's again a film. Yeah. It's yeah. not a thick three. It's a film. Yeah. So question emerges now: Is how did these dislocations, crack, and voids typically emerge? They they typically emerge under mechanical deformation. There's no mechanical deformation here, at least not explicit. So how do these misorientations and what appears to be accompanying dislocations uh, and possibly voids occur and how can we capture that? And so for that, we needed a model that goes beyond uh, traditional phase field models. We needed a model that couples the transformation, phase transformation kinetics that are built into sort of standard, standard phase field models with some kind of crystal plasticity. And because I'm running short of time, let me just skip past this and just say that we, uh, we use something known as a facial crystal model. Paul developed a new uh, kind of facial model that allows, uh, think of it as a Landau theory, but the order parameter is periodic and undulates at atomic length scales rather than just delineating between two constant values that's solid and liquid. And uh, again, I'll rush past this a bit and just show this model is uh, as, uh, the model Paul recently came up with, where the first term is kind of a polynomial expansion in N. N is the reduced density of the system. That's your order parameter. Uh, at the bottom, C2, that's where you put the non-local effects. So if you just want a simple model A, it would be a grad squared. But if you want to have high order gradients, you can capture order parameters that solidify in either constant states, liquid, or periodic states, solid. And then he added these terms that are polynomial terms coupled to the mean field free energy. So the system sort of locally feels itself on the average value of itself nearby. This was used in order to be able to generate, as shown on the right, phase diagrams that not only capture liquid and solid, but also capture a vapor phase. So a, a, a vapor phase is what will be void. And here in dynamics, in the usual way, conserve model B type dynamics that minimizes free energy in the order parameter of N. And to be able to access scales that are somewhat comparable to the experiments, he coarse grained this model into essentially a phase field model in two variables the average density, this N bar, and an amplitude, which is like an order parameter for each crystallographic orientation. In this case, we assume triangular phase, so there's three. And he ran model A type dynamics on each amplitude and conserve dynamics on the average density. This now is no longer a microscopic density, it's an average density, like a phase field. And this model is quite cool because it can allow you to simulate crystal growth into an unstable liquid via a void phase or a vapor phase. So the black here is void or vapor, very low density uh, vapor. And the liquid out here is unstable, the thing starts to solidify and it forms this kind of moat or depletion layer of vapor. So the model can do a lot of tricks. And so we applied it to see if it can do this trick here. <laughs> if it can solidify and capture grain orientations. And here are Paul's simulations. On the top are the experiments, on the bottom are the simulations. And again, what you see, the first two frames are blow-ups of two regions of the main frame here. It's a 400 nanometer width and about 0.6 microns long. Scale bar is not here. Sorry, it's on the next one. And these two boxes are shown here. Again, what I draw your attention to at the top one here is notice all the blue area is one curve, one crystal, one orientation. But notice that it gradually changes orientations within a crystal. Same thing here. You get variations in hue within a single crystal. And notice there's a lot of these dots lying around. These are the defects I'll talk about in a minute. 
that are presumably mediating or responsible for this orientation to be allowed during crystallization. If we look at our, uh, the experiments on the left, we track the orientation change within the single grain as shown by the arrows here, and that's plotted here. On the bottom is the, the line length, these white lines here on the top, and this is the mixed orientation. And on the right top frame is our simulation showing again these line lengths in white tracking through individual crystals and showing again a misorientation change as you track through individual crystals shown in the white. So again, the tendency of the model like the experiments is to show that these grains somehow seem to be rotating within a single grain as they crystallize very rapidly. And what it seems is happening, to cut sort of to the chase, is that the front, bottom left of this picture, uh, shows a solid liquid interface. The black is liquid, the stuff behind it is solid. As I mentioned, these cellular structures merge into more or less one gradually undulating interface, but there are small scale hiccups too. These hiccups kind of bounce around as the interface is moving. Think of them like turbulence. And they spawn off these voids that then move their way through the solid. And these lines of voids either can stay as voids or themselves, because of the scale involved, they're nanoscopic, transform into lines of dislocations as shown here. So here would be a zoom up of somewhere in the back here showing either lines of defects or lines of defects and voids because they're transferable from one to the other because they're so small, these voids actually are topological in nature. They carry a stress field and can actually morph into a dislocation or Collections of dislocations can become a void, but the arrays of these defects that are spawned at the solid liquid interface because of the rapidity of the motion seem to then bleed their way through the solid and allow individual grains to now start to rotate. So there's a density difference between the liquid and the solid. Yes, absolutely. That's and between, yeah, so high uh, solid, low liquid, and void is almost zero. Yes. And on the top here are rows of defects we've observed in the experimental pictures, again, suggesting that this mechanism in our simulations is also what they're seeing, because they're not quite sure why they're getting the orientations. So we thought we'd throw the model at it to see what the model says and see if we can find evidence for that in the experiment. So more work needs to be done here, but there seems to be some evidence within individual grades of the experiments that there too, they're seeing voids for sure, possibly even lines of dislocations within these changing textures. So, okay, so are the experiments to you? The experiments like with the splat crunching I showed before are quasi 2D, they're thin films. So they're as 2D as you can believe a 2D thin film is. I mean, they're much larger in the growth direction than they are in the thickness direction. And so they're behind where you can't see where there could be defects? Uh, behind here, you mean? Yeah. I don't know. I don't. The thickness of it. Like oh, you mean underneath? Like so going underneath? All the defects, are all the defects on the top? Or? This has been etched, so most likely it's already a couple of atomic layers down. So I don't have good knowledge on, you know, what of these defects are actually coming this way versus that way. So good question, and you know, this came up also in the review report, and we battled back and forth, but for our we're considering this to be quasi 2D. The simulations are obviously 2D. You know, so it's not clear. Most likely we'd have to do simulations that are quasi 3D because there's no way they can get it to be perfectly 2D. And to answer that question first. Okay, so I'll wrap up and I'm sorry I've run over time. But yeah. So what I thought, so what I've kind of tried to present and uh, maybe I skipped over a little too fast. Sorry about that. I lost track of time. I saw the thing saying 11 to 14. I said, Shh, uh, am I 15 minutes late? <laughs> Holy crap. Okay. Anyway, so the work we're doing basically is looking at constructing these models, facial crystal model or facial model. That's kind of like our industry. And we, we look to people at first principles to scale whatever parameters we can in these models and people at higher length scales to tune the rest and then connect these models you know, physically and causally that way. And what we've been showing with these models is that they're, they each have kind of their regimes of applicability, but together they kind of show a very interesting story 
of microstructure formation from the nano to micron scale, which goes from you know, beautiful patterns when the interface could be somewhat assumed to be in local equilibrium to patterns that are uh, influenced by non-equilibrium effects to give defects and crystal plasticity effects during solidification, which I think is, is, is relatively new. People generally, you'll never find a book that talks about crystal plasticity in the same chapter that talks about solidification. Or very rare, the good books do. But usually you say, okay, this is really just chemistry and thermodynamics making patterns. And crystal plasticity is about taking a block of metal and just banging it and bending. But here now we have a case during these rapid processes where certainly in the applications world, it's causing a lot of head scratching because you're getting what you think is a solidified crystal full of defects that you didn't think would be there just based on the solidification process itself. And it's the rapidity of the driving force at the interface, we think, that's spawning these defects that then work their way and quench into the solid and cause the orientation variance. And so, um, so that's it. So that's uh, that's uh, what I'd like to share with uh, what I want to share with you. Uh, and uh, I'll take any questions. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Are the uh, when they're doing this additive um, manufacturing and stuff, do they see some um, structural problems with because of these striations? Like do they make them more brittle? So I haven't. Uh, I, I'm not aware of the striations themselves beyond the Livermore collaboration if they see them, say, uh, in the, these powder drops. But I, what I do know is a problem with uh, some work I did with uh, General Electric is when they solidify the powders and they get voids, they are a problem because then you think the structural integrity is you know, one thing because you have this sort of continuous material, but then you go down to the lowest scale beyond the drop, beyond the dendrite, and you say, oh, there's actual voids there. So they act like stress concentrators that are nasty. So then they still have to, one way they get rid of them is they'll reheat treat these things to kind of heal it to the best of the can. But some of the voids are big. Uh, another thing that these voids often do while they're forming, and I didn't show it here, we have another paper on that, is they can trigger the nucleation of a secondary phase that wasn't going to be there if the void didn't sort of go lower the barrier as a heterogeneous site in its own right. And so for the striations, I don't know, but for the voids, I know they are a problem. Any, any guess what the striations might do to the structural stability of them? I think if anything, if we, if, if at the caloric cooling rates where the striations are just chemical, they actually may help in the strength because they create more barriers to dislocations to move. Through. So they may actually be a beneficial thing. Actually, I know they're going to be a beneficial thing, but I don't know how ubiquitous it's assumed. Because right now, a lot of this is just sort of very empirical. Uh, people haven't really classified this in a way that, you know, we have, say, dendritic growth, even numerically. With dendritic growth, Tammy asked the question, is there a length scale? Well, I can't write your formula, but I have a pretty good feeling when you show me your speeding, your cooling rate, what kind of lengths you're going to get and how they relate to the material parameters, but not in this uh, high-end solidification rate. I just had a, a quick question. So I can imagine in this, uh, this manufacturing where your links are sintering uh, some metallic particles, that and, and you hit it with one shot and you got some structure developing. Um, there's there's very little uh, experimental knowledge that you have to control the structure in between, you know, the, melt, the initial melts and when you get into in, in the end. So what I can imagine them doing is hitting it again. Um, and uh, have you looked at sort of sequential uh, sort of Hitting it again, sort of midway. Uh, we haven't, but you're right. I mean, sometimes you know you'll get, you know, the way these uh, 3D printers is they'll drop some liquid yeah. and move the laser. There, drop another liquid, and as the laser goes downstream, the backstream starts cooling and emerging. But yeah, you do get little defects, like Martin was asking. That's where you get some voids. Sometimes you get the voids actually just from the thermodynamics within a, a bubble itself, within a solidifying drop. But you get a lot of voids sometimes at the interface. So then they may repass. It's hard after you've built a sample to go back in and melt down here. Uh, but what they'll do is they'll keep it at high temperature for a while. So sintering, sort of spontaneous sintering, can happen between the connections and the neck that you know close out the necks that may have formed. Yeah, I guess I was sort of wondering like two time laser pulses that essentially delay with respect to one another. 
Yeah, yeah. So like zap, cool, and then zap again. Yeah. yeah. And, and the timing can be very short, so you yeah. can move yeah. uh, to the next spot, right? So. Yeah, I haven't looked at that. So we've done one project uh, with some uh, fellow in uh, New Brunswick where they're modeling FEM of this. And you know, it's kind of hard to get reliable data where they'll pass two lasers, hit it, go by, and then another one hits it, go by, but it's all continued. They, we haven't really fed that into our models yet, but it's a good point. So like, sort of like a two-step heating process, yeah. what would it have? Yeah, it's interesting, actually. Yeah. I don't know if you've looked into but with fast laser pulses, you get nice sharp holes, femtoseconds. Yep. And if you use picosecond laser pulses, they're all ugly and blasted all over the place. Because you so like it. Seems it. To me there's an interesting set of factors. Yeah, that yeah. Might be interesting. Yeah, the picosecond, it's that you, you basically like yeah, blow, blow the material right out, right? Well, the picosecond, you no, know, you basically it has time to heat up during the process. During the, during the process. Sorry, the femtosecond, I meant. Isn't the that where you just blast it out? Just blast it out. Looking at that crossover is another way. That yeah, this yeah. Time so one thing I want to do now in, in the sequel to this is before we go another pass is definitely add heat transport. Mm -hmm. And so one question that emerges then is specifically at the femtosecond, can you just use the heat equation? Probably not. Right. Right. Maybe at the so pico so you could still BS it and say it's kind of heat diffusion, but at the femto I think we have to put in phononic effects and stuff like that. Right? And I imagine it's really changing. Bonds, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you change the chemistry of the laser, right? Yeah, yeah. Change the yeah, so that might be in the regime I talked about. I passed over a bit where now you're getting complete solute trapping. The solute really is just going to be frozen the way it starts off and really won't determine the dynamics at all. Probably it's all heat transfer. Yeah. Thanks for trying. I had a question. Uh, you could just mention briefly that uh, now for uh, uh, when they build the uh, engines of planes, they don't use molds anymore. They, they uh, 3D Not everyone, but like Pratt & Whitney 3D prints its, print, its engines, at least Why? the ones I know. Why won't you 3D print a mold and then use it many times? Well, the mold, uh, because it's thick, and again, that's not to say they're not all doing it. I'm saying some are doing it. Yeah. Like I read an article the other day where it just showed, I think, maybe I'm making a mistake, it's Rolls Royce also, like they had a whole superstructure 3D printing. It's really cool. But the thing with molds is they're so thick, the heat transfer out of them is so slow, you get really large dendritic bulbous structures defining the mesoscale. Okay. And so then that compromises the strength. That, that, whereas the, the 3D printer has two benefits. One is a lot of the materials they're making are super expensive. So there's little waste because you just use it. You know, you, you don't have to chop it off and then throw things away. Second, uh, in a mold, it's very hard to get really <coughs> intricate geometries in a mold structure. Whereas 3D print, you can print almost any mold if, you're, if you can write it in a 3D print. Structure inside structure. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and two uh, and three, you know, by printing drop by drop, the cooling of each drop now is much more rapid, getting allowing you to have your final product <laughs> really a continuum that's an amalgamation of very fine structures, giving you extreme strength and uh, heat resistance and creep resistance at high temperatures. Stuff you can't really get with a mold. I mean, you have to do a lot more. Uh, with mold, you know, if I print, if I, if I, if I solidify like a cast as a slab, like say of a steel beam, that's okay because then you'll take it and you'll crush it down and you'll reheat it and let it recrystallize to get much finer internal structure. But on a delicate part who's, you know, like a, a valve or something, once you cast it, that's it. You can't break it, you can't bend it. Maybe you can heat it a bit, treat it a bit, but you can't actually change its structure. So the stuff you've locked in at the 3D printing stage is more or less what you're stuck with. I think the other important effect is Temperature gradients change as you go through the deck. So the actual heat gradients change between yeah. the skin and the center. Yeah. You can't get uniform. Like if you cast a, a block of a steel, like even a few inches, the grains in the middle could be almost millimeters big. And the grains on the surface could be microns. I have students actually do that to a pass life. And it's really awesome. I mean, if you if you look at the cut and you polish it, you see it really big in the middle. 
So then even when you crush it down to do what's called recrystallization, it's a thick slab of steel. You can never crush the middle enough. So you still get these like large oblong grains in the middle that they're kind of just trapped there forever. And so yeah, so that's kind of why they, it's become you know, sexy to go in that direction, you know, in the industry because it's saving money, net shape parts. Now you can dream up really wild parts and now design them for the first time. I was reading how, you know, uh, one of the aircraft manufacturers reduced emissions uh, at 15%, I think it was Rolls well Royce, just because of a valve in, that sprays the fuel in the injector. And that valve, the, they were heralding 3D printing as the, the reason they can now build that valve. And so it's linked to you know, greenhouse emissions and blah, blah, blah. Just makes nice patterns for me, so I, that's kind of like what I like. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so okay. thank you. Thank you. Okay.